Father, uh, we come against Satan right now in the name of the Jesus of Jesus, and we tell you, Satan, that you are a defeated foe. Yes, we have the total victory in the mighty name of Jesus over this COVID-19. We command that you be gone in Jesus' name. We pray, Father, that your spirit would be over our health, that we would be under the blood of Jesus Christ, that you would be over our finances, over our relationships, over our employment, over our children, and over our family members. Lord, we don't know what you're doing on our behalf today, but we do know that you have our very best in mind. And we receive the victory that is on the way in Jesus' mighty name as we worship today. Amen. Glory to his name. Let's worship together this afternoon. My life is in you, Lord. discovered that um, I knew about that already but just as we have come through this time of COVID both Marilyn and I you know the toughest part that we've struggled with is getting our strength back and uh, today that just reminded me right there that we need to rely on our Heavenly Father our mighty Savior Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior as our strength he is our strength he is our hope he was our life. Amen. We need to lean on him today and accept that strength that he pours into us. Amen. And for that, we exalt him. Amen. He is exalted. The king is exalted on high.
praise his name. And we shout to the Lord all the earth this afternoon. Amen. Amen. If you have come through this COVID, you know that you've got something to shout about today. Amen. Amen. Let's lift him up.
never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you, Lord, that you don't fail your children, that we can put our hope and trust in the faithful one, and you are ever faithful, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, today for meeting many needs of people from our group that have gone through sickness with COVID. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have restored, and we thank you, Lord, for your healing touch on those who are just coming through it and need complete restoration of their strength. Today we bring Irene to you. She's fallen today, and Lord, we thank you that she was protected from injuring herself badly, Lord. But Lord, we pray for wisdom for the doctor for what caused the fall. She's weakened from COVID, and Lord Jesus, by your stripes, we ask that your healing virtue would flow through every part of her being, Lord Jesus to remove all the weakness that has come with this sickness, Lord. Touch her and make her whole, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. We ask, Lord, that your presence would fill her room today, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that Manny is with us today, Lord, and he is reaching out to you. He and Lydia are reaching out to you, faith believing for a divine healing touch on his heart, Lord, to open up the blocked areas, Lord Jesus, and to pour strength into him. Lord, we ask for restoration and healing in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for others that are uh, suffering. There's been so many folks that over this last year that have lost a loved one, a spouse. Lord, and we just pray that the sweet comfort of your Holy Spirit would be very real to them, Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, that as we continue to gather, that... I think of Myrta and her husband, Lord Jesus, and he is on oxygen right now at home, and Lord, whatever the condition is, Lord, he's diabetic and he's got uh, a lack of oxygen in his system, and we pray, Lord Jesus, for your healing virtue to flow through him, strengthen Myrta as she ministers to him. We pray, Lord, for your divine touch to today for uh, Carl, who, who needs healing in his body. He's had uh, needles in his eye this week in his eyes to, uh, to to heal the bleeding behind his eyes and Lord we just ask for your divine healing touch to intervene Lord to heal that for him and strength Lord Jesus for his dear wife as she ministers to him day and night Lord Jesus Lord we just ask for your continued presence in this place there's so many needs Lord we uh, think of Gary Rollins today he needs your healing touch Lord, we pray that you would serve in the spirit to have a strong desire to, to live and to excel, Lord Jesus, that he would just have the desire to let you strengthen him and that he would be able to uh, be more mobile, Lord Jesus. We ask for your healing touch. And Lord, we give you the rest of the service. We give you the whole service. We came to meet with you. And we ask, Lord, as your word goes forward, that it would be anointed anoint Pastor Wayne and his voice, Lord, as he brings a word of life, and then help us to hear your word and be able to act on it. We ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Well, I just feel a boost this afternoon from being here with you folks. Living proof. And uh, so we're thankful that you're here today. And uh, we are about to receive this afternoon's tithes and offerings in just a moment. Um, and so I'll appreciate Larry getting ready to uh, serve us today. Um, just wanted to mention that um, uh, one of the things that we're considering um, as a Living Proof group is the fact that um, we are not reaching a group of people right now in our in our uh, living proof um, community um, and that is the, the group of people that are still either uh, looking after grandchildren in the afternoons or people that are actually still working um, that group that's in the probably the 50 to 60 65 range and um, they don't have any any ability to have to take in a week uh, midweek service and so we thought about that during the Christmas season we had a lot to think about during our three weeks off with COVID and uh, so um, we thought and we talked and we prayed 
about different things that are going on. And uh, so we wanted to make sure that everybody um, just doesn't hear the rumors that are kind of flying out there. Um, but we are uh, in the process. I brought it to staff last week uh, through Pastor John. And uh, uh, we, want to, we want to be able to reach that group of people. And so um, I've asked if it would be possible to go back to our times of 2.30 and 7 o'clock on Wednesdays in order to uh, pick up on that group of, of folks that can only come at night. And I know there are some of our group that are not able to only come in the afternoon because they don't like to drive at night when it's dark. It's difficult to see. Um, that's one of the worst times. I hate driving the freeway at night. And um, just the glare from uh, these LED lamps, you know, the, what most of the cars have today, they just blind me. And um, so um, we're going to make an effort to do that. And we're looking at possibly the last Wednesday of this month or more likely the first Wednesday of next month, which would be February. And I don't have an exact day for that, but um, we will make sure that you're kept up to date. The moment we hear, <clears throat> uh, we will let you know uh, for sure so that you can plan ahead and uh, plan which service you plan on going to. Um, I understand, John and Della, you guys called in to find out if you had to register today. We're not. Um, registering anybody. We're going without masks after. We ask everybody to come in with masks, but then to make sure that uh, once you're, you're uh, socially distanced from others, then you can take your mask off and be free to do that. Um, we've been hit relatively hard with this COVID, our, our church and, uh, and our staff. And so um, it's been a difficult time. Um, the one thing that we may have to do and I understand that from just the rumble out there that I'm hearing back some uh, discomfort with the fact that we may have to move out of the chapel on Wednesday nights. We don't know for sure at this point, but there's a possibility for the Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock. We may have to move. At this point, it looks like they're possibly asking us to go where John held his Sunday school class in the fellowship hall on Wednesday nights because the chapel for all the evening services basically being used for uh, uh, the small children uh, up till I think kindergarten or something like that. So up to about five, five years old, two to five. And so um, that's what the hitch is right now. We're trying to um, uh, negotiate and uh, see if we can uh, make some things happen there. Um, but that may possibly be our only choice at this time for a time, okay? So um, don't, don't speak anything into that. Speak positively. Um, speak positive things about the, you know, don't become negative and uh, just forget about um, uh, the fact that we're being here right now. We're thankful for that. Um, but um, we're, the church has become so large that um, every facility on the campus has become a multi-function room and a multi-use uh, room. And so that's the situation we find ourselves in right now. And so we uh, encourage you to just uh, pray about it, think about it. And uh, if you'd like to call, call into the office, speak to Marilyn or myself, um, we will let you know where we're standing at that particular point, okay? But at right now, um, um, it's just out there. It's a projection, okay? And so, um, uh, Larry, I'm going to invite you to come forward, if you would, please, and just stand at the front, and we'll ask the Lord's blessing over today's tithes and offerings. We thank you for your faithfulness over the holiday season, the Christmas. I don't like calling it the holidays. To me, it's either Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's, um, I am stuck in the mud when it comes to um, not being able to say that Christmas is Christmas or Thanksgiving is Thanksgiving. We ought to be thankful all the year round, amen? And Christmas Day in our lives as Christians is uh, the best day of the year because we have Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, amen? amen. Praise his name. So thank you, Lord, today 
for the uh, ability to give back to you that a part of that which you've given to us. We ask you now, Lord, that you would uh, touch our hearts, touch our minds, touch our spirits, and speak to us what you would have for us to give today and, uh, and use what is given, Father, the monies that are given for the extension of your kingdom around this globe. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate that. <clears throat> I won't distract you while you're preparing your offering if uh, I didn't speak long enough, but... Uh, <laughs> Maybe John can mention all the oh, yes, John, would you, uh, would you like to give an announcement about your, uh, um, your Sunday school class Sunday mornings that started this past Sunday morning at 9 o'clock? Sunday school class. I'm mean, a wonderful job, John. Really appreciate your teaching. Well, today, actually, um, I'm going to be speaking on um, first things first, which is a New Year's message, actually, and um, uh, just some things that I think as seniors we need to look at in uh, beginning this new year. And so I'd like you to turn in your Bibles. Uh, most of you brought your Bibles to look to today. If uh, if you didn't bring a Bible but have a cell phone. You can download a thing called Bible Gateway for free. And it has, uh, I think, about 60 or 70 versions, including uh, Spanish and German and uh, um, Italian, and yet probably pretty well um, near all the, uh, the many um, languages that are spoken around the world today. And so, uh, and plus about, I think, about 50 translations of the Bible. So today I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and I'm uh, asking you to turn in the book of Matthew to Matthew chapter 6. Um, let's just go a little past two-thirds of the way into your Bible and turn right. And you'll hit Matthew, and we're looking at chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Beginning at chapter, or verse 25, that is why I tell you, this is now, uh, this is a simple message today. It's probably a topic that is maybe more spoken about than any other other topic in the uh, Bible because worry and anxiousness is one of the most prevalent things in our society. So that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to them than he, they are, or to him than they, than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? I've, di I've discovered that they don't. Doesn't help me one iota. And verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or bake their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, which is alive and green today and tomorrow is cut down and thrown as fuel into the furnace, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? I'm asking you right now, why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. He knows all our needs. We've been told that for absolutely years as we've been brought up in the church. 
Verse 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, folks, have you ever been so worried, been so worried about something so bad that you couldn't sleep? Anybody? Yeah, m most everyone in a room. I don't mean for just a day or two, but I mean for weeks or even months. Anybody? Yeah. I have, and as recently as two weeks ago, as Marilyn and I were tested positive for this COVID-19 thing, there were several nights in a row that I couldn't go to sleep because I was so terrified that I wasn't gonna wake up in the morning. Um, it was difficult to breathe. Uh, I ate from head to toe. Uh, I had all the other symptoms that were going on. And I mean, I didn't know whether for a couple of days during that first week, whether I was even gonna make it. It was a terrible experience. But if you have, I want you to listen to this story this afternoon. A, a man I know was dealing with a problem related to his ministry that so consumed him and so exasperated him that for over a month he was functioning on about three and a half to four hours of sleep a night. His colleagues would comment to him flippantly that they'd get an email from him at 11.30 at night. And then they'd get a follow-up text at 3 or 3.30 in the morning, the same day. And then a f uh, the, the man knew that he, he couldn't keep going like that. Physically, his drive was being flushed down the toilet of worry. Emotionally, his, his natural glee for life was being ripped away by the jet stream of worry, just flying right, right out of there. And spiritually, his delight in his ministry was being torched in the incinerator of anxiety. Then all of a sudden, his worry basically dissipated, just left. It wasn't that he didn't care, because not worrying doesn't mean that you quit caring. He hadn't stopped thinking about how he could deal with the situation because fretting doesn't mean that you just give up, right? He didn't just let go and let God, as most of our counsel is today, when we go to see a pastor about, you know, things we're struggling with, let go and let God. There's a difference between being proactive toward a problem and being preoccupied with a problem, amen? There's a difference between being functional and solving an issue and being anxious that you even have one. What energized and emerged is that he recognized that his priorities were out of order. His priorities were out of order. Now, I read a story in that line of thinking about Desert Storm this week that illustrates this. A colonel by the name of William Post was in charge of receiving all the incoming supplies for the United States ground forces. Among these supplies, were tons of food that would come in every day. One day, Colonel Post received a message from the Pentagon ordering that he account for, if you can believe this, which you can knowing the size of the military, 40 cases of missing grape jelly. True story. 40 cases of missing grape jelly. So the Colonel sent a soldier to probe into the missing jelly saga and the soldier reported back that he couldn't find it. Colonel Post made his report to the Pentagon and supposed that would be the end of it. But I mean, after all, it was simply just great jelly. Now, remember, you've all heard about the government being involved in everything, right? So the government is involved and they weren't just looking for voting ballots, just saying. The Pentagon continued to press the colonel, pointing out that they needed, a close, uh, they needed to close the books for the month and they couldn't just, for, uh, just let 40 cases of jelly evaporate into thin air. How many have ever done books and you know you've got to settle up at the end of the month? Yeah. Uh, anybody that's ever managed a uh, Della did bookkeeping for church and other things for years, I think, and so she knows what it is to close the books at the end of the month, right? 
Well, they ordered him to make an all-out effort to find the jelly. The colonel had had enough at this point. He sent back his, this terse and fiery response. Sirs, listen, this is, this is a quote. Sirs, you must decide. I can dispatch the entire army to find your missing jelly, or I can dispense the entire army to liberate Kuwait, but I can't do both. He didn't get a reply. So he no longer worried about the jelly. But this wise colonel comprehended something about his superiors that his superiors didn't. See, when your priorities are out of order, you'll be preoccupied by the wrong things and focused on the wrong things. And so the result is worry and anxiety that is both fruitless and preventable. Now, at the beginning of this brand new year, and as we begin this week of prayer emphasis, and uh, I'm throwing in an announcement there, uh, we started on Monday night with the week of prayer emphasis in the sanctuary at six till seven, and everybody's invited to come and just come and go as you please, uh, stay as long as you can or as brief as you can. And at the same time, pastor has started this 21 day fast I want to ask you to do one thing that would make an astounding difference in all of our lives here today. I want to challenge all of us to read the Bible through this year. Maybe John has done the same thing. I don't know. But um, uh, it's something that uh, is Pastor John, uh, not Brother John, Pastor John, um, is um, make, uh, making that an emphasis. And so there are Bible reading um, schedules that are out in the foyer that you can pick up at the information desk um, that will help you in your reading schedule if you decide that you would like to do that. If you've never done it before, it's daunting. It really is. Um, I've done it several times over the years, but um, it's a daunting task because um, you have to read the Bible every day for 365 days of the year to manage the read-through of the entire 66 books of the Bible. So, but we encourage you to do that. Now, I want all of us to, to uh, be challenged to try and do that this year. And how many of you, uh, how many of you have ever watched game show shows on TV? Yeah. Uh, my mom used to love watching Spin the Wheel. That's what she called it. <laughs> I can't remember the exact name of you, huh? Wheel of Fortune, thank you. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> I've watched, I used to be amazed by it, you know, how people could just pull those letters out of the simple, out of the blue air. And, uh, but anyway, so most of us are familiar with the envelope or the prize card that's being pulled, uh, pulled by the host, right? In essence, what I'm, what I'm asking you to do here is to open up, and referring back to the Bible reading, to open up an envelope from God himself every day. And that's precisely what happens when you read God's Word. You're opening an envelope with the love of God written right there before you. My grandparents used to have scripture cards on the table all the time. They just remained there. They had one in the kitchen. They had one in the dining room. And so at every meal, we pulled, everybody sitting around the table would pull one of those cards. And we would read the front and we would read the back. And that uh, was an amazing uh, tool to be able to memorize Bible verses as they come up. And so today I can find myself, along with my wife, who repeats most of all the Bible verses that she hears that are, uh, you know, if we're listening to a message on television or a word of prophecy on the television, she's repeating the uh, scripture verse right along. And, uh, and I recognize those verses. My memory um, uh, never was as good as hers. Um, she, she has an amazing uh, gift for remembering lyrics of the old songs, the old hymns of the church. Uh, she knows verses that were never printed in hymn books. Uh, it's an amazing thing. But um, I could never, uh, I remember, <coughs> pardon me, I remember in, in uh, Crusaders, which was the group uh, Pentecostal uh, Assemblies of God, uh, Boys Club in church way back uh, and and uh, we had, uh, in order to earn our badges, we had to learn scripture. 
and memorize scripture. So that we, we uh, you know, we memorized such and such and we did a badge for that. And so um, I remember my shirts were always just jammed up the arms and across the chest and on the hat. And, and uh, so I, I remember when those scriptures come to mind or I hear them again, that yes, and I can almost, almost say the reference when they do that, it has stuck in my mind, amazing. Now, I want to dig down a little bit deeper on this subject today. See, fixating on one thing or just a few things can be risky if it's the wrong things. Are you following me? That's why I want to talk about first things first today. When we concentrate on the wrong things, it leads to a problem that we all have to deal with at some point. It's a problem called worry. In the Sermon on the Mount, the most prolonged portion of that message deals with worry. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Now, how many of you find it interesting that Jesus pointed out that people worried about stuff 2,000 years ago, just like we worry today, and actually about comparable things? They weren't exactly the same things, but he says there in Matthew 6, 25, in the Amplified, Therefore I tell you, stop being worried or anxious that is perpetually uneasy and distracted about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body as to what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, here in the United States, we don't typically worry about having something to eat, drink, or wear, except during this pandemic that's going on right now. Um, there have been more reports of that, I think, uh, more so than maybe has ever even happened in the last 150 years. Even though there are people during this pandemic who are struggling, and I'm, I'm not denying there's some hungry children, perhaps some adults in this country, but when, we, when was the last time you literally heard of someone starving to death in America? We don't hear about it. In fact, now we really don't hear about it because they've taken the media away, right? So who are you following? Who are you getting your information from? Now, we still worry about life and mortgage payments. I understand all of that, having a job and health insurance and having enough for retirement. In other words, we worry typically about finances, and I understand that. Poor people are disquieted that they don't have any money, and rich people are apprehensive that they don't have enough. Poor people spend their life looking for money, and, and rich people spend their life stockpiling it. Now, Jesus does mention something in verse 25 that people worried about 2,000 years ago and are still frantic about today, and that is our body. <clears throat> How many of you have noticed since Christmas time, or since before Christmas actually, all of the commercials on TV about getting the most, the latest fitness machine since our assault on the grocery stores over Thanksgiving and the Christmas and New Year's holidays. They, have you noticed that? It's on there all the time. And that's that specific one that hangs on the wall and you look into it and do your, your, uh, um, your exercises right there watching, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall. Have you seen that commercial? They're trying to sell that. I don't know if it's no good or what, but <laughs> they're trying to get rid of them. Um, Everybody in the world, it seems, is born with this innate self-consciousness of how we look and how we appear to others. Paul Harvey once told of an old man he knew who put braces on his false teeth so he could look younger. You believe that? That's Paul Harvey. That's gospel. An old fellow that put braces on his false teeth so he'd look younger. Now, there's one thing specifically that all of us in this room fear and we think about and, and, and that stays on our mind day and night and it plays on our minds. That is we worry and we fret about the future and rightly so right now as we navigate our way through this COVID-19 pandemic followed up by the recent election corruption. Sorry that I'm just calling it for what it was in my eyes. 
which is why Jesus concludes this message with this lesson in Matthew 6:34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Those are the words of Jesus. Friends, we allow the clouds of tomorrow to dull the sunshine of today. I remember message, this, uh, messages that Pastor Anderson, who was here at First Assembly when I was here the last time, about 23, 24 years ago, and he spoke on this subject. I think about if I pulled out one of my old Bibles, I believe I've got notes in there five times next to this text. Um, and the, um, the references and the illustrations and all of that with it. It's an important subject. Friends, we allow the clouds of tomorrow to dull the sunshine of today. Now, I'm going to announce something to you this afternoon. Announce maybe is a poor choice of words, but it's probably something that you already know. If you want to live a life that's barren and doomed, you just waste it doing one thing that is totally pointless and redundant, and that is worry. Flat out. Now, I can help you with this because I'm a well-journeyed participant along those lines. Just saying. I have worried myself sick for most of my life. Now, Jesus does all of, all of us a big favor here. He appraises and recalculates the reasons for why we worried, and then he eradicates and chucks the cause of worry and elevates us above worry. Aren't you thankful for that today? First, he's going to give us the downside of the problem, and then he's going to give us the ups, upbeat side of the solution. So he's single-minded here about putting a stop to worry. Aren't you thankful and grateful today that Jesus is always interested in providing for us a solution for our problems? And friends, when it comes right down to it, and I'm 71 years old now, um, I've discovered that instead of looking for help from somebody else and looking for a word or some, from somebody else, that the main place I need to be going is talk to Jesus and hear what he has, what he has for a solution to my problem or to what I'm looking for. Amen? He is the answer to our problems. Three times in this message, or this passage, Matthew 6, verses 25 and 31 and 34, in the English Standard Version, he repeats and echoes a phrase that says, therefore, do not be anxious. Those are, are the uh, five words right there, spoken by Jesus. The Greek word, merimena, uh, na o, I missed the O on the end, for, for anxious, or what we would call worry, is a combination of two smaller words. One word means to divide, and the other word means the mind. Divide the mind. In other words, to worry is to have a di divided mind. There's a phenomenon today in the female world known as multitasking. I've learned this. <laughs> I don't have an answer. I'm waiting on God to tell me the answer. It's the absolute marvel of computing the execution of various diverse tasks simultaneously by one person. Now, if all of us men would be honest, we know that when we multitask, we're not doing anything very well, right? Well, Al, you're, a, you're the exception. <laughs> I know a pastor who still calls his mother several times a day. I used to when we were in Canada. I don't know Well, she's gone now. And he admits that there are times during those calls when he gets her on the line that he gets into the habit of answering his emails while he's talking to his mother. Not a good idea. He says, you know what? She can always tell. She always says, get off your computer for a minute and talk to me. Even at 80 and 90 years old, mothers are still mothers, correct? 
See, man, a divided mind always leads to diminished performance. <laughs> Pick it on the men for a minute there. So how do we stop worrying? Well, one thing we know doesn't work. Have you ever been worried and upset about something and someone says to you, well, quit agonizing over it. Quit worrying about it. You know, everybody seems to think they have the answer. Has that ever happened to you? Now, let me be honest. When I'm fussing over something and someone finds out and they try to tell me to quit it, it makes me kind of worry about them. Now, Jesus does something that's just fantastic here. He does something that no other therapist would have ever thought about, I'm sure. He said one of the ways to quit worrying is to become a bird watcher. It's true. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 26, in the message translation, look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to its job description, careless in the care of God. I love that phrase, careless in the care of God. Don't you love that? And you count far more than to him than birds. You, I. How many of you have ever seen an incapacitated and stressed out bird? Let's say a sparrow. They look like they don't have a worry in the world, right? Have you ever seen a bird? Just picture the sparrow or picture a robin in the spring, pacing back and forth on a branch or on a phone line, and he's all up in a state about what he's going to eat. You ever seen it? I determined in my research this week that there has never been a bird in therapeutic history that has ever been treated for hypertension, high blood pressure, or stress. It's just the way it is. Friends, what could be more simple than this? Jesus himself says to learn a lesson from the birds. They sing, they chirp, they tweet, they fly, they soar, they build nests, but they don't worry. They don't even know that they have a God in heaven who cares for them, but we do. There's a pile of stuff that we can learn from the birds about what not to do in our journey through life. Amen? Now, I was at 122 pounds when I got married. A little bit lighter than I am now. Um, quite a bit lighter. <laughs> Literally, John, you're looking at me in awe. Um, it was awe, <laughs> like a pencil in my pocket. I was 122 pounds when I got married. Have you ever heard the expression, he eats like a bird? Yeah. Well, I was teased as the tenor singer in our quartet called the Centurions when I was 20, that I sang like a bird and had the legs to prove it. That's the truth. I was introduced one night in one of our concerts like that. I found out that birds can eat two or three times their weight in food every day. That's amazing. In fact, if every human ate like a bird, he'd be consuming somewhere between three to 500 pounds of food every day. So that but backs up the theory and the fact that it's true that some people eat like birds. Come on, that was a joke. <laughs> then Jesus takes us from watching birds to doing arithmetic in Matthew 6 verse 27 in the message translation has anyone been fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch think about it worry doesn't add one thing to our lives friends you wish you weren't so short worrying won't make you taller You'd like to get rid of some weight while well, worrying doesn't lose a pound. You wish you had more time on this earth. Worrying won't give you another second of time more than what God has planned out for your life, friends. Worrying never solved a problem, never dried a tear, never lifted a sorrow, and never removed a hurt. Worry has never made a wicked thing good or a good thing better. Someone said that worrying, get this, is like shoveling smoke. You're not any better off when you're done than you were when you started. 
I'd like to, you to write down two statements. There are a couple of things that you should never worry about. First of all, never worry about things that you can change. Now that makes perfect sense. If you're worried about something you can change instead of worrying about it, go ahead and change it. And then secondly, never worry about things you can't change. That also makes sense. Worrying isn't going to change anything you can't change. So if you can't change it, why worry about it? My wife has told me that. So except for the things that you can change and the things that you can't change, you might as well just go ahead and worry about anything else. Okay? Now Jesus gets down to it, to the core problem of worry here. The first point is the problem. And write down something that you're worried about, the problem. Just write it down, there's a blank there. Matthew 6 verses 27 through 30 tells us, has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion. Do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop. But have you ever noticed, or have you ever seen color and design quite like that ever before? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look like, sh like, look like shabby alongside of them. Now, he has talked about the words of the, the birds of the air, rather, the flowers of the field and boils, our whole problem down to one thing, and that is puny faith. Puny faith. Then in Matthew 6, verses 31 and 32, Jesus sticks the knife in and he just gives it a massive twist. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never seen, or even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting, so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over those things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Will be met. So are you starting to comprehend what worry is here today? I hope so. It all boils down to this. Worry is practical atheism. First of all, there's no question there is a God. There is a God. Secondly, indisputably, God controls my life and your life. And thirdly, there's, it's a proven fact that God loves me and cares for me. Fourth, so why worry and get bent out of shape over it all? Why worry? Friends, we worry because we haven't come to grips with the fact that there is a God. Or even if we have, we really don't believe he's in total control of our lives. And if we do, we don't believe he cares for us. Otherwise, there's no need to worry. Now, Jesus has spent all this time and all these verses talking about the problem from a negative standpoint. So having discussed that this afternoon, what is the solution from an upbeat perspective today? Secondly, the solution, the correct application. Matthew 6.33 tells us, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now this verse was my favorite verse when I first entered the ministry uh, 45 years ago. The disarming word there, and, uh, and the most critical word, is that word first. You see, the resolution for worry is simply putting first things first. I saved this till now because this is what I want you to walk out of the door with today. Correct priorities stimulate peace in our lives. When you're single-mindedly fixated on the right things, you're not going to be worried about the wrong things. Amen? Jesus instructs us that there are two things we ought to stay laser-focused on in every aspect of our lives, and that is his kingdom and his righteousness every day of our lives. Our personal motivation is to focus on A, God's rule over my life, 
and be God's righteousness in my life. I'm not talking about concentrating and obsessing with your eyes, folks. I'm talking about fixating with your heart. Fixating with your heart. You see, focusing with your eyes involves seeing. But focusing with your heart involves submission and surrender. Surrender your worries and focus on His will. It's just that simple. So correct priorities stimulate peace, but out of place positions heighten our worry. No matter what you say your urgencies are in your life, what you worry about is really your essential need and focal point. <laughs> you see, if we're, we were worried <clears throat> more about making money than we are about spending time with our grandchildren, You may say your priority is your family, but it's not. If you're worried more about buying that brand new 80 inch TV that you're, uh, you're about, <clears throat> than you are about giving God his tithe, you may say your priority is God's work, but it's not. If you're anxious more about how to cover up sin than you are about admitting it and repenting it, repenting of it. You may say you're concerned about getting right with God, but you're not. <clears throat> Friends, every day that your first rolling out of bed prayer should be for his rule over your life and his righteousness in your life. And when that takes place regularly, guess what happens? When you focus on his will, he takes care of your worries. When you focus on his will, he takes care of your worries. And Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Or as another translation puts it, he will give you everything you need. You focus on what God wants to do in you and through you every day of your life, and he'll take care of what needs to happen to you and for you. Are you with me? Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So we need to look one way at a time. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then live one day at a time. Amen? Meet today's problems with today's strength. Don't be getting after tomorrow's problems until tomorrow. That right there creates more worry in our lives than we need to be worrying about. Amen? How many of you have discovered that God doesn't give you any strength to face tomorrow? He just gives you the strength to face today. I've discovered that. Sir William Osler, who was a renowned Canadian doctor, gave a commencement speech to the students of Yale University on how to make the most of life. He told the story of being aboard an ocean liner and he was visiting on the bridge with the ship's captain one day when a loud piercing alarm sounded followed by his strange, his strange grinding and crushing sound below the deck. How many of you would, that would make you just uh, cringe just a little bit and think, what is going on? He told that story and there was this a piercing alarm that was going on uh, below deck. So the captain said, those are our watertight compartments that are closing. It's an important part of our safety drill. In case of tr real trouble and water leaking into one compartment, it won't affect the rest of the ship. He said, even if we were to strike an iceberg, now that's always uh, an encouraging thing when you're taking a cruise. Uh, I'm sure you got this lecture when you were going to Alaska, right, John and Della? 
<clears throat> hitting an iceberg when they're all around the ship. Even if it were to strike an iceberg like the Titanic did, water rushing in will fill only that particular ruptured compartment. It can't get to the rest of the ship. Well, that part's encouraging. But it's the crunching and crushing part that, that really kind of is upsetting. <laughs> Just before you're about to go for a meal. Now, I'm using that as an illustration. This is what Osler said to those, those uh, students that day. Each one of you is certainly a much more marvelous organization than that great liner and bound for a much longer voyage. What I urge you to do is that you learn to master your life by living each day in a daytight compartment. And this will certainly ensure your safety throughout your entire journey of life. Touch a button and hear at every level of your life the iron door shutting out the past the dead yesterdays. Touch another button and shut off with a metal curtain the future, the unborn tomorrows. Then you will be safe for today. Now he continued, don't think of the amount you have to, to accomplish, the difficulties you have to overcome, but set earnestly at the little task near your elbow, letting that be sufficient for the day. For surely our plain duty is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand." Close quote. In other words, just what Jesus said, look one day at a time and live one day. Live one day at a time. Now, I'd like to ask you to go home today and sit down at a table and take a sheet of paper. Then I want you to write down the top three to five things that you, you personally, you personally are concerned about today or worried about. And then I want you to bow your head and surrender every one of those to Jesus Christ. Shift your motivation. We need to change our urgencies and be consumed and fanatical about his kingdom and his righteousness. And then let him worry about everything else. Can we do that this week? I don't know who penned these words that I'm about to close with, but they're certainly worth listening to. I want to quote, what does your life revolve around? What does your life revolve around? Remember this as you consider your answer. We've made ourselves, we have made ourselves the center of everything in this world. But God is going to be at the center of everything in heaven. The decision you made or will make either for or against Christ should be immeasurable by what your life revolves around. If it isn't God, you're probably not going to like heaven and you probably won't be going to get there. Friends, if you make sure the one, two, or three things that you do this year are the first things you should be doing, God is going to tend to everything else. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, for these simple thoughts and ask, Lord, that you would magnify them to our minds this afternoon. I pray, Father, that you would bless every person here that is sitting within the sound of my voice, that you would touch them with your strengthening and power, empowerment today, Father, by your Holy Spirit. Move upon our hearts, move upon our, our minds and our spirits today, Lord Jesus, and give us grace for the day. You can give us the grace for tomorrow and tomorrow morning. We ask that you administer to us and continue to speak by your Spirit to our hearts as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please lift your hands for the blessing this afternoon? Now, Father, bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. I pray today that you would give them your peace that surpasses all understanding so that they might come to know and understand that in the midst of their greatest struggle, that they are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. 
There is no enemy that can defeat them, no obstacle too great. They will be crowned victorious because the spiritual warfare they're in right now has been won through the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, we thank you for this today. Now use us for your glory as we go our separate ways, Lord. May the rest of 2021 bring us untold blessings as we are used to make a kingdom dis difference in the world around us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone, VF Assembly to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you, and may God bring his richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless. Keep praying.